Hello, everybody. It's Tuesday, March 9th. Chris is not here because moving is more important to her than you are. You know, I said to her, I said, she said, oh, we got to move all the big furniture today. I can't make it. And I said, Krista, what's more important? You moving your furniture or the patrons? How much more important is you moving your furniture than the patrons? And she said, well, you can't divide by zero. So I guess infinitely. And I thought that was out of bounds. I didn't like what she said there. But. It's not, not only that, there is, you know, Linode is also not important to her. You know, Linode has been sponsoring the news on and off now for a while. You should definitely check out Linode for their hosted services. Level one has been using Linode for a number of years. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe that it's March already because it seems like Dev Ember was yesterday. But uh, we're still getting, like, an amazing amount of internet traffic to our Dev Ember project. So, like, in October, we started a, co a development contest in a Minecraft server. We had people doing stuff, writing content, and we are still getting tons of traffic and tons of participation in that. Even though it's over, we've mailed the prizes some of them are stuck in customs, but we've ma mailed the prizes, and mostly everybody's getting their stuff, I think, probably, pretty sure. So, yeah, thanks, Linode. Uh, if you want to level up your skills with hosting and virtual machines and that kind of thing, check out their tutorials and their guides. They've done a lot of work, but we use them for all of our stuff. They're cheaper than Amazon by a lot, and it works better. Super convenient, too. If you want to test something out, if you don't want to bother with all that other stuff, Linode is very convenient. Also, they're not they're no longer charging us for the Minecraft server, which we didn't anticipate. But thanks again for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's unanticipated. We'll probably be moving that before too long, but that's fine. Yeah, well, it, great company and they have a great product. You know who maybe doesn't have the greatest products, at least not yet, is electric vehicle companies. And one of the big sticking points there is where do you charge it? If you charge it at home, now you've got a radius. And people don't want a radius. So, what are we going to do about it? Our fearless leader has the answer. Ars Technica reports that Biden is pushing an EV charger utility network thingy. They're planning a unified network. Joe Biden has called for 500,000 new EV chargers by 2030. This seems ambitious, but it's really not. A lot of uh, car dealerships want in on the whole you know, electric vehicle charger thing, so... They're real excited about deploying this kind of stuff. Now you're wondering, what do those colors mean? Well, it's a bunch of different companies. This is not really a standard or a consortium in terms of like everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's doing their own thing. They're just agreeing geographically on, geographically on where they're going to do it. And they're all going to kind of work together to give you EV chargers. Yeah. And it, it's there's also a you know variation of standards. So there's like, you know, the 400 kilowatt ones. And then like the 250 kilowatt ones and, you know, sometimes you can't even, like the grid won't even give you that electricity. That's the other really interesting thing about some of these EV chargers right now is that the charging station might support the high capacity. But if you show up on a hot summer day and everybody's got their air conditioner on, it's not going to charge at the fast rate because the, the grid doesn't have the capacity. Well, that's the other thing. A lot of people are saying, hey, I don't want to hang out at a gas station for 30 or 45 minutes. Does it make more sense to put EV chargers at a restaurant or a grocery store? I think it does. I think so too. Of course, you're gonna have to kick in something. Well, maybe not. I'm sure that they would love to have those parking spots. Yeah. Because you're guaranteed to have someone in the store for 30 minutes. At least, yeah. Probably going to the deli. It'd be perfect, you know, for grocery shopping trips. Absolutely. So, uh, this might end up being a move that we just end up with abandoned chargers because no one cares because they're everywhere because <laughs> the market dictates it because the market dictated it not <laughs> the leader that's how yeah. that works uh, biden also weighed in on another big tech matter and this one's bigger even than amazon i mean amazon's big but this is even bigger <laughs> than amazon i'm surprised he weighed in on this one to be honest really yeah what about his history uh the corporate donors Nah, he's got to pander to his base. <laughs> Plus, they got the they got Amazon by the balls. What's Amazon gonna do? Yeah, Biden expresses support for Amazon union vote in Alabama. <laughs> Make your voice heard. Also, it's very important what you're not realizing here. Like you're not reading between the political BS. He didn't say vote for the union. Uh. He just said vote. Yeah, make your voice heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think. 
Yeah. It's clear what he wants you to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be sure, like unionization is a big part of uh, American history. And a lot of the time it is the tool, the only tool that workers really have to prevent from, you know, being completely 100% and unilaterally screwed. It's just that a lot of the modern rules around unionization are designed to handicap the whole idea of collective bargaining. Did you hear about the uh, schools in California, I think it was? Uh, where they were like, we should you know, collectively bargain, and then it was like, no, that's illegal. Well, maybe. But the latest <laughs> thing is they're fighting not to go back to school because they say that minority children are overly affected by that. Hmm. and that white and oddly enough middle eastern parents are pushing to go back i don't know how the middle eastern parents get in there but anyway the leader of the union weighed in on that and you know and they were talking about it and he was like no this is murder if you go back hmm. and then he was caught dropping his kids off at preschool <laughs> well maybe he doesn't want his kids i wouldn't either <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> <laughs> but when you're in, you know, a position of power, you should have to follow the rules and you should have to follow them <laughs> to the letter. You should is, have to practice what you preach, which is what the US Navy has failed to do. <laughs> the US Navy is indeed liable for mass software piracy and appeals court rules. So the US Navy had some software they wanted to use. It was a German company and they deployed it and the agreement and it was not there was no signed contract but the the agreement that the court was able to piece together was you can use it but you got to keep track of the licenses and how many licenses you have and then pay for that and so the lower court or the first ruling was well the navy had a right to use it well, yeah but you never paid the company based on the usage so they had to go to the appeals court and the appeals court said okay the lower court said that you had the right to use it okay that's correct but the right to use it without paying the German software company, that's not actually correct. You actually should have been keeping track of the licenses. So you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. And because of that, you're liable for software infringement. And it was a crazy number of installs. It was like 500,000. Yeah, it was like, well, they just installed it on all their computers because they didn't want to think about who actually needs it. I get it. <laughs> I get it. But each of those should have been a license. Yeah. And yeah. that's what the court has said, which is why that big number <laughs> is coming out there. Now, of course, if you are American and you feel good about this story, why? That's your money. <laughs> it's going to Germany. <laughs> and it's only going to Germany because a huge mistake was made by stupid people. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Arizona, they are attempting, much like California, to move the state of the legal system by being the first to legislate on something. And there are two particular companies who are very, very interested in the outcome of this. <laughs> Arizona advances bill forcing Apple and Google to allow Fortnite-style alter alternative payment options. The bill HB 2005 opens the door for alternative payment systems. So basically, if you're a developer and you live in Arizona and you receive payments from these platforms, they would be required to give you an option. I think it's if you're a user. Or a user. Well, a user has the option to pay the developer directly, I if guess. If they reside in Arizona. Yeah. So this is the first article where it occurred to me what's really going on here. These legislators, this is not the first time we saw this. Remember, we reported on this a couple of weeks ago, and it's like, this is a trend, there's a sea change here thing, blah, blah, blah. What's actually happening here is lawmakers are using this as a cudgel with uh, Apple and Google in order to collect sales tax for their state. The point of this is not to help the citizens or the developers that live in their state. The point of this is to get Apple and Google to collect sales tax. They haven't asked for that yet, but that's coming. Mark my words. That would... If you had piecemeal state-level laws, that would make sense. But if there's a federal law, yeah. you wouldn't have to do that. So, I don't know. I'm sure the lobbyists are getting plenty of overtime. <laughs> All those states will be like, yeah, you, you totally have to use Google as your payment option as long as we get our cut. Because they will get cu a cut of that if the developer is local to the state for sure. So, and That's not the only thing that states are trying to change when it comes to tech law. And this one has to do with the whole, like, who's liable for an online platform who controls it? Who decides what is the truth? Really? When you <laughs> drill down to it, this is the ministry of truth. 
<laughs> Digital communication regulation in the Colorado General Assembly. None of these people have read 1984. Or they have a copy at home that's highlighted and, you know, like got little <laughs> markers in it. It's like, great idea. Great, great idea. idea. Yeah. Definitely oh. do this. They talk about misinformation and the, the usual suspects of like why online free speech is bad. And they're saying that if you are a big enough online company, you're going to be registering with them. You're going to be providing them with stuff at your cost. And then you're going to be liable if anything goes wrong against their rules. I like how literally nothing we've seen so far addresses the real problem, which is that it is very, very commercially viable to be dishonest online. Like it's commercially advantageous. It's capitalistically advantageous to be dishonest online. None of these things address that head on. But also, I think tied in with that and tied in with so many of our problems as a country is mental health. <laughs> yeah. Because you're never going to eliminate the worst one or two percent who do most of this stuff. Yeah. Because they have mental problems and we don't. <laughs> Sometimes we elevate them to billionaire status. Yeah. Or <laughs> put them in government. <laughs> we do that a lot. Across the pond. They have some laws that aren't so bad. In fact, these are actually uh, pretty decent, at least relatively. Although, uh, kind of a, a <laughs> narrow scope for this one. Yeah. EU law requires companies to fix electronic goods for up to 10 years. There's a lot of asterisks and gotchas and things that make this completely impractical. But, um, yeah, that's the thing. It's, it only guarantees it for certain appliances, right? Yeah. It's like... Uh, TVs. TVs, washer dryers, hair dryers... Refrigerators. I imagine other stuff gets caught up in that, but like, where's the cross? Does an air fryer, is that an appliance? <laughs> it's really down to just parts availability and documentation and the thing that, it, you know, makes it make sense. Do we really want, you know, you, you know, the old uh, Motorola phones that you would hold up to your ear and it was like holding a book up to the side of your head. It's like, do we really want those to still be, you know, operational? Like the technology to support that just doesn't make any sense. But who decides? Yeah. That was uh, one of the other kind of disturbing things about this. is So there was two big things here. Obviously, documentation, which they try to hide, and parts availability. You have to make parts available for, was it 10 years, I think? Yeah. But if a part is considered like high uh, skill level installation, they can then gate that behind state licensing so that only professional shops can get those parts. Yeah, they, they do that with uh, HVAC systems, but most modern HVAC system, systems are to the point where an idiot can install them. You can literally order a mini split system off of eBay that's pre-charged, and if you can solder a copper pipe, you can install it. You don't need to know anything. They disagree. Yeah, they do. They really do, <laughs> vehemently, and like with like spit on you as they're talking to you. And in France... A similar argument. Now, France has this law, and they say that you need to be scored on your repairability. And some companies don't often score very well. <laughs> so they don't like to display that. But the French government says uh, you will do it. The Verge has this amazing article. Apple forced to add iPhone and MacBook repairability scores to comply with French law. So we've got the, the screenshot here is of the iPhone, which amazingly somehow scored a 6 out of 10. It's not that repairable. They pointed out how, why that was. Like, there's a, so you self-report, yeah. which is, uh, come on. But there's a bullet list, and if you lie, you know, France is going to nail your balls to the wall. <laughs> so they are very careful to, like, exactly to the letter, do everything they can minimally to get above the 5. Samsung, they pointed out, buried some stuff on its website somewhere and they got like a point out of that because <laughs> wow. it was documents on how to do stuff good luck finding it but it's better than nothing i guess <laughs> we right? put it on the internet behind a password and told google <laughs> never to index this good luck <laughs> remember when uh when i can when we gave it away when we gave away our power and everybody said, listen, this is, well, this is not political. This just makes sense. We would never like just decide who can and cannot be on the internet. We would literally never politicize the numbers and names authority of the internet. You're crazy if you think the U.S. giving this up is a bad idea. This is good for the world. ICANN refuses to accredit Pirate Bay 
founder Peter Sund. I don't know if I got that right. I'm sorry. Due to his background, according to Torrent Freak. Now, Torrent Freak rightly points out that on the accreditation application to become a registrar, it asks, you know, have you ever been involved in criminal fraud? Well, Peter Sund was convicted of criminal copyright infringement, but that is not a fraud crime. And so it was rejected. And so his commentary on here is like, this is basically a cabal. And they won't admit me to the club because my past makes them uncomfortable. Which, you know, the Streisand effect is, is, is in effect here. This is not, you know, for their own rules, that's not a valid rejection reason. But you're leaving a lot out. I mean, yeah. he, that was the first email. Was like, you lied on your application. And so then he successfully argued what you just said about the fraud thing. And they were like, yeah, well, we don't like you. Yeah. And we respect copyright. In other words, you know, we're in the pocket of the copyright cabal, and um, we're just not going to do it. We don't care for you. I like copyright, too. I don't like copyright lasting for 100 years. It should be like a patent. How and, is copyright more valuable than a patent? And, but the other thing here is he started a company that does domain registrations, and I think it's becoming fairly successful. So it's not just him they're affecting here. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of people that are being affected by this. That's arbitrary. Disgusting. Also, it doesn't that, doesn't that say the market that, is rigged? Well, not just the market that is rigged, but there is no path to redemption. Yeah. Once a copyright offender, you might as well just keep doing it, right? <laughs> Once a copyright offender, you're basically right up there with uh, murderers and blah blah blah. I, you know what we should do? We should do some digging because I bet you one of the people that was involved at like Enron or Lehman Brothers or somewhere like that. I bet you one of them is got some kind of a business that has some kind of an ethical requirement for this. And arguably those companies had way, way more uh, stuff in the fraud category than Pirate Bay. And they're probably like... How about the Bush family? <laughs> I think there's anything in their past that might prevent them from, you know, like running a company or a country? A uh, little bit of nose candy never hurt anybody. <laughs> I'm not even worried about that. <laughs> So uh, the other thing that our glorious leaders are a little bit concerned about, and probably rightly so, is the arms race. And no, I'm not talking about military uh, you know, weapons and that type of thing, because we're clearly ahead on that. I'm talking about <laughs> the... Uh, yeah, I mean, we spend so much money. It's, <laughs> I'm sure China is like way closer than they should be, considering the, the spending deficit. Well, but, the thing I'm thinking about is like, as soon as we've got really amazing ground to air lasers, suddenly our air force doesn't matter. I don't think we have those. Well, I don't think anybody does. Anyway, that's not the thing we're talking about. What we're talking about is the AI. <laughs> China will dominate AI unless the U.S. invests more, the commission uh, warns. Well, yeah, China's got more people with an IQ over 120 than we have people. So the more they can educate them and the more that they can drive them to working on stuff like this, the more of a problem we're going to have if we measure our economic worth and stuff like that as to what we're doing with AI. It's also true, you know, there's that old saying that uh, for all the ills of slavery, it does get stuff done. And China, you know, they got the whole Uyghur thing and they have a situation where in their school system... They can motivate their students by basically, you know, like threatening their families or telling them to you know, lower their social score. Or Cattle prod. If you want a future, you know what you have to do in China and you really have to apply yourself. Maybe not the case in the U.S. because we have more freedom and more of a safety net. But do we give that up to win? Because then does that not mean the whole world becomes a Uyghur camp? Yeah. These are questions we are not qualified to answer. Ultimately, I think what they wanted with that story was to get a bunch of tax dollars yeah. for AI. And chip fabrication and all that kind of stuff. Which, I mean, I guess it's probably better than, you know, spending it on dead technology. Gender studies? Yeah. You think it's better than gender studies? I think Global Foundry should, like, there should just be a matching program. Like, somebody, there should be a ledger somewhere. And it's like, all right, we gave $4 billion to gender studies. We're just going to cut the check <laughs> to Global Foundries right now for $4 billion. Oh, you're such a bigot. <laughs> China is definitely leading the world in one aspect. I don't think anybody else is doing this. Now, everybody's floated some balloons, but China is right on the precipice of actually doing it. China charges ahead with a national digital currency. 
the electronic Chinese Yuan. You were correct about that. It is. It's like Yuan, but you know, I, you don't, I don't think the on is. I think yuan. it's like Yuan. Yeah, it's like you say it really fast. Yeah, it's Yuan said really fast because <laughs> I always can because I would hear people say it and I was like, "Are you talking about the Japanese yen?" No, it's like no, it's different. It's it's got a little bit of the French component because, like you know, with like French words, it's like you have to like you know say it in your nasal cavity. Okay, so I don't know. Somehow it's magical. I don't. But know. the alternative, I guess, you know, the for yeah. the English speakers is remembi or. Remain to be here. It's also incredibly difficult. Oh, <laughs> did that? St- it's fine. There was a minor ha- mishap off camera. Okay. Anyway, oh, I didn't change the thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, China is charging ahead with the national digital cor- currency, according to the New York Times. Times. Yeah, yeah, we read oh. the he- we read the headline. Oops. It's fine. Um, this is sort of fun, but the New York Times basically copy pasted the article from China which reads kind of like propaganda, which mm-hmm. basically just said, hey, this is not any different than using, you know, digital currency. The government sent me $30 and I used it to buy some, some Raymond or something, which is my takeaway from the Raymond? article. Raymond? Yeah, I know. It was just like, wow, this seems kind of like... It's ramen. Ramen. Well, whatever. So there's a lottery. <laughs> I did you understand that... I, did you have to register or did they just already know who you are? I think they already knew who you were. So randomly, some people got 30 bucks. And a message is like, go spend your 30 bucks and let's see how this works. Yeah. So. Because yeah. we want to track it. And you and everything that you do from which, now on. Which really doesn't sound a lot different than what we would call in the West a Visa gift card. Except more trackable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know who's got to be a little bit upset about this, although I doubt he will voice that fact, is uh, Jack Ma. <laughs> It's like I came up with this idea. <laughs> he didn't just what come you... up with it. It's his his version is already there. Everybody's using it. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Oops. Poor Jack. I guess he can console himself with his billions of dollars. Moving on to security. Oh wait, no, this is still government because this is China. Well, it's but, it's, a, it's an excellent bridge story. Except this, I don't think this is the bridge. Maybe it is. It is. Look what I did unintentionally. <laughs> so uh, China, you know, we do blame them for a lot of hacking, and they probably do a lot of it. They probably deserve it. Their, their latest uh, target is a big one. U.S. has issued a warning after Microsoft says China hacked its mail server program. All federal government agencies have until noon Friday to download the latest software update to block the uh, perpetrator. They literally just modified this right before we went live to say that if you haven't patched by now, unplug your server. And they're serious. Yeah, and that means they probably saw some stuff already. Now, I saw one report on the Solar Winds hack that said that they did actually download some source code related to Exchange. I don't know if they're related, but I really think that we should be looking at the whole Solar Winds source code. Did they get source code? Because this is zero day in ex- zero days in Exchange. Is there actually a relationship there? Because if it does, it suggests some collusion between Russia and China, or possibly that we got one of those actors wrong. Or no, remember how Solar Winds had two intrusions? Mm-hmm. Could easily be the other one that China came in afterwards, and they're like, "Yeah, we'll take some of this." Yeah, but if Exchange is compromised, what do we do? Uh, the cloud version of Exchange was somehow hardened. So, you know, your on-premise Exchange people—that's welcome to your second-class citizen experience. <laughs> so Microsoft is loving this. Behind yeah, the scenes. yeah. It's like we're finally going to drive more people <laughs> to the cloud. This is totally not intentional. Oh, uh, that's disgusting. <laughs> Although people running exchange on premise are got to have a little bit of Stockholm syndrome anyway. It's, it's <laughs> not the best. Now that's if you're going to hack or you know attack people digitally. Sometimes you want to go after Microsoft. You sometimes you want that big juicy target. And that's maybe if you got a nation state behind you. Because otherwise, what are you going to do with that exchange data? But if you're just a, a little ham and egg hacker, you know, working out of Ukraine, you might want to pick an easy ripe cherry hanging from the tree <laughs> who what are they going to do about it really <laughs> right for extortion navajo national or navajo nation hospital targeted by large-scale ransomware attack there were a few publicly available details about the hack which highlights how hospital staffers are often caught in the middle of ransomware attacks look hospitals it generally a mess this is you know serving 
not a not an incredibly wealthy hospital. Let's say I think they get twenty thousand patients a year, and they were almost all Navajo. Yeah, so there's not a lot of and not for profit. It was subsidized. Yeah, not a lot of cybersecurity here. This is actually one like I don't think that I'm for more government regulation, but I think that you know there should be a hotline or something that you could call when you're a hospital to be like, hey, can I get some help here? But see, I think this is a situation where it was probably like, okay, we don't make money. And we're working off of subsidy. So I have to make a choice here. I can cure these little Navajo children's tuberculosis or I can upgrade the server. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to be running that server on uh, bailing wire and duct tape from now until the end of time. And you're going to get ransomware. Yeah. Overall, that might be worse for the people. But when you're, in the, when you're looking at those kids, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, a lot of the time, I mean, the... the modern times is that we don't have people with a level of skills to automatically be the defenders in that situation the, the people are literally helpless there's a threat that they didn't even know was there they're in a high crime neighborhood they don't realize it we should start a, like a Navajo IT nonprofit. we we'll make a ton of money doing that or just just a, a like a cyber security non-profit and get some federal funding no you just lost all of our funding you have to target it to a specific oh, a, group. Oh, a specific yeah. disadvantaged group. Yeah. That's how you're going to get... That's how that GoFundMe is going to get sweet and rich. The battered women's cybersecurity. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mess with gender right now. <laughs> Mothers against denial of service. <laughs> <laughs> has there already been something called Mados? I bet there has. <laughs> Sometimes hackers do things uh, for good. Remember the guy who was destroying the routers that had been compromised? <laughs> Might as well. I'm just sweeping trash off the internet. What are you talking about? Other times they do things for good on the way to doing something bad. Hackers exploit websites, WordPress, to give them excellent SEO before deploying malware. Cyber attackers turn to search engine optimization techniques to deploy malware. It's like, oh, you've got a you, you run a local salon and spa. You just need to deploy some SEO things, make it come to the top of Google, and then you just deploy that malware. This is that malware, and they're getting so good at it where it tracks the IP traffic, so it only infects you the first time you visit, and it looks at a variety of things about you to determine if you might be a threat to it. And if you are, it doesn't show you the malware. And uh, mine's a little Monero in the background, you know. Well, it can payload whatever it wants. Equal opportunity malware. True equality. <laughs> well, not really, because it's... it's uh, It's got a little bit of self-preservation there. It's profiling, basically. Maybe not racially. Digitally profiling. That's what it's doing to you. Also, uh, every once in a while we get these. This is definitely just an arms race. It lasts for days, but I like seeing it. It's good. Hackers release a new jailbreak tool for almost every iPhone. Yeah. So the, the, the other takeaway from this is any iPhone currently in law enforcement possession now no longer protected. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, did it, did it lock up? Well, it's not locked. But oh, yeah, it is. is. Oh, there it goes. The video it's guy. crashing. This is not anything new. We get this about every six months. Uh, in, my, in this case... I, this wasn't mentioned in the article, but I read something on a chat room that suggested that they did actually offer this to Apple, and Apple did not want to pay them what they thought it was worth. I don't know if that's true or not. That but makes sense. There are transactions like that going on with Apple, where it's like, hey, I found some stuff. Do you want to buy it? And Apple's like, <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, we'll fix it three days after you release it. Yeah. And sure. The guys in the basement won't get to go home for a weekend, but what do we care? Yeah, that's Apple. This is an interesting thing. Um, they just did the, describe this as high tech. I don't know if I agree with that. No, it's not really high tech, and it's not really anything new. But I guess because of the situation that we're in with the pandemic, they're just seeing way more of it. Popular Los Angeles restaurant closes after high tech dine and dash scheme. So basically, you put in an order. And then you say the order never came and you do a chargeback. And in one case, one of the orders was for $700. But, but they, he, he picked it up. They picked like it he up. He actually came and put down a credit card. Yeah. And, and then just charged it back. Yep. 
So this is really, really terrible. Credit card processors should be required by law to do more in these situations, especially when there's a, there's a whole run of chargebacks and investigate the whole thing as a whole. A lot of the time this is done algorithmically and in the most half-assed way possible. So that restaurant had to shut down and uh, they did a GoFundMe, but they only GoFunded her debt, which was like 60 grand. Yeah. So the restaurant's still not coming back. Running a restaurant is brutal. Yeah, well, especially now. Yeah. Remember Spectre? <laughs> it's been a long time since we talked about Spectre there. For a while, it's all we talked about. <laughs> if you're a VMware administrator, every time you log into vSphere, it's like, by the way, all your servers are crap. <laughs> and the thing about Spectre is it was this big story. I remember it was like, oh my God, but, but nothing ever happened. And we became complacent again. And inevitably... <laughs> First fully weaponized Spectre exploit discovered online is actually a clickbait headline. Um, a security researcher submitted a couple of pieces of malware that were capable of reading the shadow file on Linux, which is like where the encrypted passwords are. But there's no evidence that these have been used as part of a larger malware campaign. Well, they had a Windows one too. Oh yeah, there was a Windows version. But like but. you say, in the wild, does that mean it was actually affecting somebody or... Eh? Yeah. So it's maybe not as alarm. It's kind of like the whole, the Spectre thing was always like this. It was like the headline came out and everybody was just running around on fire. But in reality, yeah, it's bad. But so far, nothing's really happened. Give it time. Solar Winds suffered quite a bit of embarrassment. And if they weren't embarrassed enough about losing everybody's data and being the next big company to be synonymous with failure... They also had that embarrassing password, but solar winds one, two, three, they are not taking responsibility for that. Former solar winds CEO blames the intern for solar winds one, two, three password leak, which signals everything that you need to know about solar winds as a company in that they're not willing to take responsibility for their stuff. And you probably should find another company. Someone is going to come and buy them and maybe it'll be better. But for right now, for the tools and the level of expertise they have, obviously the people that built the company are no longer there. The people that had any idea what they were doing are no longer there. And they're probably not a company worth doing business with. Now, here's the question that I had. Uh, see if you got any uh, more clarification from that article. They said that he was responsible for the leak because he put this on GitHub in plain text. That part, maybe, I believe. But did, does that mean that he was not the one who came up with the password? Or was he? I think that that's a deflection, a distraction, yeah, an, right. ex an excuse so terrible that it's like, you know, if it weren't for my horse, I wouldn't have spent that year in college. It's like, and now everybody's thinking about just how terrible of a take that is when the reality is that they just, this is just, they need to suck it up and say, you know what, we made some mistakes, we're making some structural changes to prevent these kinds of mistakes in the future. We really learned some stuff. They need to have a little bit more humility. Blaming the interns is not. But a, there's two possibilities I see here. Either you let the intern come up with the password, which is <laughs> probably not good. Because this was a high-level password. It, it let them get to everything. Or you came up with a terrible password <laughs> and then gave it to an intern. <laughs> Who then leaked it on the internet. So th there is no path where you did the right thing there, I yeah. don't think. And there were some process failures that ultimately resulted in an intern doing what interns do. In, in some ways, the intern helped them harden their infrastructure. They learned some things. <laughs> The intern was their black swan event, and they can learn from that. That's how you red team. I bet that intern does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Microsoft has for a while now been decrying the end of the password. They want alternative authentication, and they want your identity to be immune to all this leak stuff. How do you do it? Well, their plan involves that beautiful keyword that everybody loves right now, blockchain. <laughs> Microsoft's dream of decentralized IDs enters the real world. The company will launch a public preview of its identification platform in the spring and has already tested it at the UK's National Health Service. Basically, you're carrying around a token that gets more stuff added to it constantly. So you can't steal it because nobody has the current version of that token except for you. So basically what they're doing is they're setting up your entire identity to operate the same way that Facebook operates. Isn't that exciting? And I imagine when you submit that token to various places online, 
They will not track that. <laughs> Definitely how, will not track that. How horrifying is it going to be when you go into the hospital and they're like, you know, welcome to the hospital. And it's like, oh, we're a modern hospital. We don't need to see your insurance card or anything like that. Just log in with Facebook on the terminal here. <laughs> or you walk into the hospital and they're like, uh, please step onto the green conveyor. And then the green conveyor just sends you back to the parking lot because you don't have insurance. <laughs> and you didn't have to tell anybody about that. They already knew. <laughs> But our healthcare system, as uh, dismal as it is, I mean, it is, it's bad. <laughs> Maybe not as bad as Jamaica's. Maybe we're just a little higher than them still. Jamaica's Jamco almost said the headline, pulled offline after third security lapse exposed traveler's data. So you got you to gotta have proof of immunoz immunization. You got to do the contact tracing. The contact tracing is the real big one here because that's where they lost so much people's personal information because it was all loaded into this thing that was horribly insecure and probably built by an intern. Sorry, interns. Well, they mentioned the firm that built it. Their interns. Like, they actually did hire somebody to do it. But uh, you, this was the kind of thing where I think if you, you could manipulate the URL. Yeah. So you could get whatever. Just You could just guess and get people's information. And included where they were staying during their quarantine. So you could get somebody killed with this pretty easily. Yeah. And it was all the foreign travelers. Nice. This was also, I think last month, they leaked the entire database. Insecure database set up. So they lost their database, they recovered from that, and then they found out that the whole thing was on the web anyway. Oops. I wish I could do a Jamaican accent so I could make a joke about that, but I can't. I think that would ha have us end up being canceled. Oh, you might be right. If Krista were here, <laughs> she could get away with it, I think. Probably. That's well, because of her Jamaican heritage. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's funny. And finally, our last story in security. Um, if you'll think back, during the pandemic, when we started talking about a vaccine, and people were like, man, I don't know about this vaccine stuff because the thing I'm worried about is you're going to treat me different if I don't get this. And we haven't really been tested a lot. And I, well, you know, we got some questions. And they're like, you're out of your mind. Track you for getting a vaccine? Are you stupid? We would never do that. That's crazy. We just want you to get it. We just have to flatten this curve. That's all that matters. <laughs> and now <laughs> vaccines are rolling out and we get this headline. CVS and Walgreens looking for big data reward from all the vaccinations. Here's the alternative headline that I would have gone with. CVS and Walgreens looking to exploit the data they've collected from giving people vaccinations. Now, this Wall Street Journal article is not painting this in the light of, wow, that's bad. Yeah. They're painting this in the light of, oh, are you a CVS or a Walgreens investor? Because they're really going to make as much as they can out of this data. Yeah. They even pointed out that CVS noted in one of their investor calls, the number of people who had never filled a subscription or prescription at CVS, but did get the vaccination. They're like, look at all these new customers we can engage with. Yeah, yeah. We can market to these people. Yep. It's great. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Try to, if you've got a small local pharmacy, try to deal with them instead going through this. Cause they don't have the, they don't have the big data. They also point out that if you want to get this vaccine, like just walking in and be like, all right, here's my insurance. No, no. You register. They have to have a phone number. They have to text you. You have to confirm. So they're picking up all these data points as they go along. Yeah. And they're keeping it. And again, like if you can go for the small pharmacy because they're not going to be able to do anything with that data once everything's done. Well, they'll sell it to CVS. <laughs> That's all we got for this one. What do we got tomorrow? Tomorrow we got business and I don't remember. Neat. We'll see you tomorrow without Krista. And it's time for me to move on to my... Going into the hard stuff, huh? Delicious root beer. Delicious non-alcoholic root beer. See ya. I was going to say is there such a thing as alcoholic root beer, but there's alcoholic everything. Now. Yes. Yeah. Hard Mike's hard lemonade kind of thing. Yeah. I had some of that Strongbow stuff. It was really good. That's the apple stuff. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Alcoholic apple juice is delicious, but the sugar content and the yeah. alcohol content, I find that's a bad combination. It's a, I got a little bit of a headache after an hour or so. I don't like things that mess with my head that much. It's the difference, and for me, there's no reason to do the first one. It's the difference between enjoying alcohol and abusing alcohol. Yeah. And I go right to the second one, because why else would you drink poison? <laughs>
Sometimes it helps you poop. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely ending on that. Thank you.